you in here, everybody. Um, as you can see, I have a lot of logos up here. We work really hard to collaborate in this basin, and I have, I'm really fortunate to have worked with great people that are here to talk to you today. So we're going to start off with Scott Nikolai. I'm going to get his slideshow up. Scott is... Scott is the most passionate habitat biologist I have ever met. Mm. He works for Yakima Nation Fisheries, and I believe he turned the, wood, the term wood is good in rivers. So I'm sure he's going to talk to us about wood. Thank you, Mel. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you all. I actually am also a CW grad, mm. uh, and I, I'm, one, I'm just curious. Uh, I'm uh, first generation uh, college graduate. My dad actually didn't didn't finish high school. Mom uh, went to a one room school in Pennsylvania, uh, and I always wish she would have gone to college, but she didn't. Any other? Probably folks my generation, first first generation college grads. Impressive. Cool. Well, um, I think we're getting to be less and less, and that's a good thing. I. Actually, I'm so thankful for the education that Central gave me. Uh, it was perfect for where I was in life. And I, I actually didn't think I was smart enough to go to college and might do construction for a while before I gave it a try. And uh, I have been working in my position now for over 20 years. Time flies, right, Dr. Beck? <laughs> and uh, I. I love my job. I really do. I, I don't love every aspect of it, but I go on vacations and think about work and write notes down and come up with new ideas and look forward to collaboration. And my hat is off to Mel for, for integrating our work, all of our works, with the university through the internship program. That is like, thank you for doing that. So I, I just want to talk about what I do, I work for a, a, a sovereign tribe, the Yakima Indian Nation. Uh, I work for about 10,000 enrolled members who are very interested in their treaty. Um, and the, one of the things I, I really want to say is, coming from a very white Anglo background, you know, I grew up with an image of what, what tribal people are like. And uh, uh uh. <laughs> I, Phil Riggin is my boss's boss. He's an enrolled Yakima. He has a master's uh, from Yale in forestry, and, and he's a rock star. He is like, every time I hear him speak, I, it makes me want to work harder. Um, and he is very much into uh, integrating our program with, with other programs to further our efforts. Um, I'm going to try to make this short. I'm going to go too long. Careful. But we, we were very active in the Tiana way, and it's because of Phil that that happened. I also work with uh, guys who are fish technicians, and really their only interest is in harvest, getting fish into tribal nets. That's that's all they care about. So it's it's the gamut. So I work in streams like this. This is Tam Creek, and I used to think, oh, what a beautiful stream, and that is not a beautiful breach of stream. That is woefully degraded. The riparian's coming back, but there's no pools. There's uh, the, the gravel uh, arrangement is very uniform. Um, there's, there's no complexity. If you, if you are a fish, and this is your house, it is a house full of hallways. There's no kitchen and bedrooms and bathrooms and that sort of thing. It's just a hallway. Um, and obviously we Pointer? The top one. Yeah. We've got problems with uh, climate change, so we're thinking about where did we come from, what are, why do our streams look the way they do because of the past, and where are they headed, what's, what's going to happen in the future. So climate change is a big deal. We're dealing with land use. The tribe has actually bought, I've been involved in a lot of acquisitions, so now I'm get, getting to the what do I do. Um, this is a piece of property, 417 acres total, that we acquired. I have been 
involved in 20 land acquisitions where we're actually buying and protecting and leaving alone habitat. This is the bullfrog exit, exit 80 off of I-90. Sun Katy is up in here. The Clayton River runs down through here and joins with the Yakima right, right there. Yakima River flowing this direction. And this is a gorgeous place to, to protect. It's really good habitat. We do fish screens and passage. There's an unscreened diversion right here on Wilson Creek. Uh, fish just ran down the irrigation ditch. Uh, and the tribe funded the, the fix for that. This was a violation of an RCW that was put in the books in the 50s, but it's never been enforced until this so-called voluntary compliance that's been in vogue for the last 12 years or so since the listings. Oops. All the red dots are the documented fish, fish passage barriers. Fish passage, artificial barriers are a violation of state law also. And there are many, many more uh, barriers that are not documented. So we've got a lot of work to do on the fish passage front. This is a screen that we funded last year um, down in the Natchez. This was about $670,000 for this, uh, for this uh, fish screen off of Scott Ditch on the lower Natchez. Funded with, with Yakima Nation dollars through what's called the Accords. Uh, the, the tribe signed a, an Accords agreement with the federal action agencies saying, okay, we're not gonna sue you for for 10 years if you give us a whole bunch of money. So the program got a huge wad of money to do good stuff for fish. Uh, we do have cat <clears throat> restoration. I, this is my passion. I swing wood into streams. Uh, and we are really loading our streams up with large woody debris. Um, this is a project that I finished last fall on Lower Swap Creek on the Swap Valley Ranch. Uh, where we put about 920 large logs into the stream to do all kinds of great things for stream mechanics. We also do mitigation. This is a project up in Cleelum. The Yakima River flows this way. And we are, we are actually mitigating for the impacts associated with our hatchery. Mel, do you know about this? Salmon in the classroom? Yes. <laughs> Becca, where's Becca? Becca, no, Becca, Becca no. So, so for quite a few years now, we've been getting school kids out and running them through some learning stations. I bet maybe we'll see more slides. Like that. And one of the cool things we do there that I think is cool is, is the kids. Here's a kid <laughs> dragging, dragging a log. There's a log into the creek, and here's the creek. And that's the tool that this person is using. So they are actually putting the wood into the stream, and the supervisor, whoops, right there, is talking about why wood in streams is important and good. And this is really valuable because kids then see the wood going in, they move it into the stream, and they hear why that is so important for stream health ecosystem function for amphibians and beavers and river otters and all kinds of other stuff. So I'll, I'll end with a little talk about the Tanum floodplain restoration project that I implemented over the last four years now. We put lots of wood in the stream, lots and lots and lots of wood. This is what it looked like during construction. Then we had a, a the, bit, the flood of record for Tatum Creek, as luck would have it, six months after we implemented the last phase of the work. And that's, you know, Tatum Creek was bank uh, edge of valley to edge of valley. It was 400 feet wide, running at 2,500 CFS, cubic feet per second, which is about as much as is in the Yakima River during much of the summer. And this is what it looked like after the big flood. You can see water on the floodplain out here. And that's, Freddie Fish is going to talk about why, <laughs> why wood in streams is important. And I can't give a talk without talking about this. It's, we 
because it reconnects the stream to its floodplain, and you get lots of groundwater recharge with super cold water. Um, so this is all flowing out across the floodplain in April, May. Water is very cold, and it's it's charging the groundwater table with cold water, and it's getting at this hyperreic function. The hyperreic is the shallow groundwater that some of you, I'm sure, know about. Maybe all of you that interacts very frequently with the in-stream flow and is often full of aquatic insects. Replenishing streams is good for native plants, and these are germinating native plants that are now, some of them, six feet tall out along Canyon Creek. Canyon Creek is, is good for side channel development, and side channels are, are bread and butter for salmon. So all of these red lines are new side channels that we think it is definitely, they're definitely there because of the wood that we artificially recruited to the stream. Wow, says the fish <laughs> over three miles. So I, I gave a talk last spring and I call wood replenishment a superhero in the, in the battle against climate change. Maybe the, the, it's a superhero in terms of coping with climate change. That's it. Thank you, Scott. wondering why I'm here when this is science talk and you're talking about habitat, but we recently formed our flood control zone district and one of our big focuses in that district is to improve our floodplains, which is going to reduce flooding downstream. And you can see from Scott's talk where everything went. Um, <laughs> there you are. Scott wants floodplains to be restored so it helps fish habitat. We want floodplains to be restored so it reduces flooding. We have the same, different goals, but the same endpoint. So we're doing a lot of partnering with groups like Becca's group and, and Scott's tribe, or hopefully even partner in the future, and hopefully get more into this habitat related stuff. But for me, I'm, I'm a planner. I'm also the floodplain manager. I started off doing transportation planning and now I'm moving more into environmental planning. And if you don't know what a planner does, um, we'll go here. We do a little bit of everything. And just in case you are interested, here's a list of what I do on a, any day. And it's a great job because every day is something different. And my job is getting even better now that I'm floodplain manager because I get to go do things like float the river. That was like uh, two weeks ago. That has so far been the highlight of my seven year career here. <laughs> <laughs> is spending a day floating the river instead of sitting at my desk. Um, and I'm Christina Woolman, and I was doing a Woolman pedal, pedal count, so. You know, <laughs> Okay, for the Flight Control Zone District, like I said, we are focusing on projects that are going to improve the floodplain, but we know that those projects also have to improve habitat. So right now we're starting with assessments because we really don't know what needs to be done in the county. We are currently in the middle of an assessment on the Yakima River from the Hanson Pits, which is at um, Josem Road, down to Ringer Loop. And we're getting started on an assessment of the Wilson Creek watershed, which is everything east of Ellensburg. So that includes Wilson Creek, Nanum Creek, Cherry Creek, basically every creek that's east of here. And so if you live on one of those creeks, you're going to be hearing from us in the near future. We're also focusing on channel improvements. 
um, my director, Kirk Holmes, if you ever meet him, he'll probably talk to you about crack willow trees. He is on a mission to eradicate them from the county and get better vegetation growing up <coughs> in our creeks. And so we have done one project so far where we removed crack willows, which were clogging up the stream, and we planted better trees, and it's been a big improvement at that location. Where, where did you guys have that? That was on Colton. It was at Mo Road, Mo and Joseph Road. I don't remember which creek. Okay, and how? I'm sorry. I usually don't schedule talks on Fridays. We always schedule talks on Fridays. <laughs> So at this moment, we don't have a lot of need for interns when it, that are focused on habitat. But we are working with the groups in this room that do have a need for interns. So, But we are always in need of interns who want to do GIS work or data collection. So if you're interested in that, and even if you just have basic skills or if you want to learn about it, we can get you started just doing some basic projects. We also have a very robust construction management internship program with Central, and so if you have any friends in that program, you should tell them to check that out because it's a really great program. And if you are a member of the community and you want to be involved, we have public meetings for our assessment projects, and next month in May we're having another public meeting for our Yakima Reach Assessment, and the, our consultants are going to go over the results of their habitat assessment and their flood hazard assessment and give a preliminary list of ideas for projects that can be done in that reach that will improve both flooding and habitat. We're always looking for ideas for projects. If you, if you live next to a creek and you've seen the same thing happening every single year and you have an idea of how to fix it, we'd be interested in hearing about it because it's something that we might be able to work on. And we're, I'm always looking for historical photos. So if you have a good source or you have an old um, photo album of a flood from 50 years ago, I'd love to see it. And we also have an email list where I on occasion send out newsletters and things like that. And so right now, not, not a lot of science related <coughs> stuff going on, but we really hope that as our district evolves and my education grows in this field, uh, because as you see, I have business degrees, and which are from Central, by the way, and <laughs> planning degrees. I don't have a lot of knowledge of fish and habitat and things like that, but I'm definitely learning. And we are really moving forward towards doing more projects in this realm. And hopefully, in the future, we'll be working with some. Wildlife, so don't ask me any questions. <laughs> I work in Columbia Fisheries, but they gave me some slides to present. So Fish and Wildlife here in Ellensburg has two divisions of fisheries research. They do a lot of great studies and the wildlife management. So I'll start in fisheries. I did not take any of these pictures. They're gorgeous. <laughs> this is a day at their office, the beautiful Yakima River. One study they do, they have little fake reds. A red is just a fish nest, R-E-D-D. -D. And they look at survivability of egg to fry in spring Chinook and coho. They put them out in a lot of the tributaries. They monitor temperature, photo periods, and they, this is a really good indicator of water quality. If it's taken a long time for these guys to hatch or maybe they're not surviving, then there's something wrong. So these are kind of indicator studies. I have little arrows here showing snorkelers. There's one right there, another one over here. They're looking at fish abundance. So they just get to swim around, or rather float around, looking for fish. Not a bad way to spend your day. They also do some electrofishing to capture the animal, capture the fish, to put pit tags and take genetic samples of these. Um, have anybody done backpack? Of course, Paul James has. <laughs> so what that is, we have a backpack that has a long rod with an electrical pulse at the end of it, and it temporarily stuns your fish so that you can net it 
to handle it. So it's a good way to catch your organism. Another way, you guys heard the saying, a bad day fishing is better than a good day at work. Well, for these guys, a bad day fishing is a bad day at work. They get to fish for work. So they're looking at studying spring chinook, mortality of hook and line. So they have to capture the fish by hooking it. They put a radio collar on it, let it go, follow it to their spawning grounds, and see how recreational fishing is impacting survivability of chinook. Not bad, right? Get to fish all day. They have a good job. As I mentioned, they also do wildlife management. We're very fortunate to, bring, to give them two interns this summer looking at bighorn sheep survivability in the canyon. Across the U.S., a lot of the populations have been declining due to disease outbreaks. Our canyon population also has this disease. Don't know what it's called. I apologize. But we are supplying interns that study this. So they're following these sheep around all summer long. They start next week. And they're looking at survivability of both the females and their lambs, seeing if the disease is spreading in the population. Most of you probably already know about the elk feeding station in the El Murray, but that's just another thing that they're doing here in Ellensburg. So lots of great things coming from Fish and Wildlife these days. Um, they have six to eight <coughs> temporary seasonal positions in fisheries every summer, so if any of you are looking for jobs, they employ a lot, and I get reference calls all the time. So, a lot of you interns start applying, they're looking for help. And two wildlife biologist positions helping trap and relocate nuisance beavers, their seasonal jobs. So if you're interested in learning more about fish and wildlife, you can go to their website, wdfw.wa.gov. If you're a master hunter, you'll also get credit hours. So there's lots of good opportunities and ways to get involved with fish and wildlife. Next on my list, I'm pretty proud to introduce my friend here, Kenny Evans. She's a botanist at the Forest Service out of Playello. <coughs> She's very knowledgeable. <laughs> okay, so like Mel said, I'm a botanist for the Forest Service. I work at the Playello Ranger District. Um, I've been with them for going on five years now. Um, the Forest Service has a lot of great opportunities for folks. Um, oops, I had um, just to kind of put things in perspective, um, the forest is divided into separate regions. Um, for us, Washington and Oregon comprise um, Region 6, but there are opportunities all across the United States. And I would say probably your best bet is um, be willing to look into all the other regions, be willing to move, be willing to relocate. That's your best bet as far as getting on with the Forest Service. <coughs> This is my office, most days, um, one of my offices. I have lots of sites, but this is why I love my job. This is where I can be. Um, um, there's a lot of people in the Forest Service who are similar. We want to be outside. That's why we're in the positions that we're at. For the Forest Service, this is usually the face that everybody thinks of. We're fire related. And yes, that is a big part of the Forest Service, but we're so much more than fire. Um, Within just my district, we have developed recreation. Um, you can see on the upper um, left hand, oh, yes, left hand for you guys, um, Lost Lake had a rave party. Part of what they had to do was clean this up. They took out three truckloads of garbage. So, not glamorous, but it's something that we do. Um, the same thing with trail maintenance. The trails that you use for the Forest Service, they have to be maintained. That's one of the Forest Service responsibilities in the National Forest. We have LEOs, law enforcement. So if that's um, an area that you're interested in, law enforcement is a great way to go. Forest management, um, timber related, um, mining. We have a lot of mining in the Liberty area. Um, gold pan, we have active claims that are mostly, uh, mostly personal. They're not the big commercial outfits that you see, but gold mining is a big thing. In, uh, National Forest. Um, botany, that's my favorite. Um, <coughs> ranges from anything. We have weed management stuff. We have um, restoration. Um, right now we're really involved with the I-90 project up at Snoqualmie. Um, they've finished up the first five miles. They're starting in on the next five miles. As the Forest Service Agency, because they're going through Forest Service land, they are required to revegetate with native plants. So we've been working with them gathering up seed, um, up here in the corner is they um, finished up that first five miles, this is the Hayak 
uh, maintenance facility for Washtenaw here. Here is where they've spread seed that I've collected, so these are my babies, um, <laughs> for the Arnani project. We had probably six species that um, three of them were ready for this time period. We still have three more that are in production that should be ready to go within the next couple of years. So it's pretty exciting. Um, again, seed collecting. These are salmon berries um, in the bags here that I have had a seasonal, a seasonal help collect. Um, and again, the planting for these plants, they've been working on growing them out, um, ferns, um, for the project as well, and the plants will be going into the ground next year. So that's, I'm really excited to see that part of it as well. Um, so as far as getting on with the Forest Service, because we are a centralized agency now, all of the hiring processes go through Albuquerque, New Mexico. Makes it really convenient, right? <laughs> My advice <coughs> is to get familiar with these, darn it. you can just talk about it. <laughs> no, because I, I need to point. Um, get familiar with these websites, especially the USA Jobs. It's really intimidating for a lot of people because most of our hiring is online at this point. You have to go through USA Jobs if you're wanting to apply for positions. Um, go in, get familiar with the website, um, play around with it. You have to have your application material online as well. So just get used to playing around in there. Get used to being in there. And it will really help in the long run. And I'm done. Our next speaker is the Miss Columbia Fishery Enhancement Group Program Director, Ms. Becca Wassel. Thank you. Um, well, I was thinking, I, I gave a Friday seminar in this room about 12 years ago, and everyone looks exactly the same. As, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure I do too. <laughs> but since we're speaking a little bit about careers and how we got started, I actually have some thanks owed to Dave Darda and Paul James, who got calls from me back in 2001 as I was finishing up my master's in Wisconsin. And I was moving here because my husband had a job at Central, and I was thinking, well, I sure hope I find something to do with streams and fish there in the Pacific Northwest. Luckily, it worked out, and I started out working at the Forest Service as a fish biologist. I was there for six years, and then moved into a position with a nonprofit organization Mid-Columbia Fisheries Enhancement Group. And both positions have been fantastic. And I would encourage folks to think about different ways to keep learning and growing in your field of interest, because there's things to be learned at lots of different places. But right now, my job is to convince you about just how cool it is to work with Mid-Columbia Fisheries. So <laughs> that will be my focus. And it's really, really fun. As a nonprofit organization, we're completely non-regulatory. We do not find ourselves in the position of having to turn a blind eye to somebody's cows in the creek because we don't have any enforcement weight anyway. We're not in any position to write them a ticket. We also don't find ourselves in the position of trying to really work with a landowner who is super reluctant. If we find someone who's super reluctant, we typically need to back off from a project because if we can't coax them through education and persuasion and uh, chocolate chip cookies, we move on to somebody else who might be up for working to improve salmon habitat on their property. So we work with voluntary landowners. We coordinate a lot with partners, particularly the Yakima Nation, Department of Fish and Wildlife, the counties, the cities, probably a lot of people I'm forgetting. And we try to focus on priority actions to restore both salmon and steelhead habitat and water quality. So Mel's given us a, a scattering of slides to show you some of our high profile projects. And I'll just highlight them as things that we've been doing and then turn it over to Mel and the folks who worked with us last summer, who I will never stop saying thank you to because you guys just got so much work done for us, uh, to talk about how an internship with our group really helps salmon restoration, but also can really help you career-wise particularly all of you who are in tenured positions already. So, um, this is Reeser Creek. This is the portion of the creek that goes from Dollar Way down to Irene Reinhard Park in the city of Ellensburg. And people have driven by that site for a long time and thought, well, that creek just doesn't seem like it should, I guess I have to use the pointer. That creek doesn't seem like it might have chosen such a straight path, historically, and what a strange deposit of 
five foot high fill in a trapezoidal alignment is running along the left face of the tree. What would happen if we were to take that dirt, move it back, and allow this area to be open to flooding? Well, Carol Reddy is a very skilled uh, grant writer and project putter together. And working in her capacity with the Yakima Tributary Access and Habitat Program, she secured a lot of funding and a great conceptual design to do that. Unfortunately, she then discovered that the organization for which she worked doesn't do construction projects. So they needed a partner who could hold a construction contract and move forward. Um, we were very excited to do that. This was the largest project mid Columbia Fisheries had ever taken on. And so we worked with the YTAP program and with the city of Ellensburg and with Scott's money and with money from many other sources to take this bill and move it over here. It opened up 58 acres of floodplain that had been inaccessible since the 30s. And then just as icing on the cake, we gave a pilot channel to the stream with some meanders already built in so that the creek could begin to form its own channel and have more structure and diversity than it had before. This has been a huge learning experience on this project. We're having really great success with the 6,000 trees and shrubs that were planted there in 2011. Unfortunately, they're just not growing fast enough to provide the shade we'd like to see to the channel that has widened from about 35 feet to 50 feet over the two years since it's been constructed. There are things that we'd probably do differently so that we had greater protection for water temperature in the short term if we were to do this again. But some of the things that have been fantastic in here are that we've got fish using the area, and we had them using the area while the crews were still out planting. We have this great video of one of the WCC crew leaders pretty much in tears as she's watching a coho salmon come up and spawn right where she's planting the trees and shrubs. It's, it's an emotional experience. Um, and then the collaboration has been amazing. The more this project gained momentum, the more we found other partners to work with. And Central has actually been one of the newer partners on the table, but critical, because the interns worked last summer to establish monitoring so that as we move forward we can see how are the plants doing and how is the channel changing. Talking too much, I can tell. Okay. So, another thing that we do a lot of, besides moving creeks around and moving levees, is just looking at streams and their existing alignments and how we can improve their riparian condition. Currently, Mel has been spending lots of her time down between Sunnyside and Granger, supervising the planting of 10 riparian acres on the river, right where it's at its pretty wide slow part. I have a colleague who calls this the Mississippi section of the Yakima River. <laughs> lots of big, eroding banks, wide river. But this area that had been in pasture and previously cultivated for hay, is on the property of a landowner who really wants her farm to be a demonstration for sustainable agriculture in balance with nature. And she invited us to come make things better. So we've been having groups of school kids from Sunnyside and Granger come out and plant the area and learn about salmon. And it's just a fantastic experience. They've been engaged from the beginning, monitoring what's there now, to the planting, mulching the plants, and they're going to come back and see how things are doing. We've also been working in the Tianaway uh, with the grazing lessee. Previously, he was leasing his land from American Forest Land Company to run his cows, now from DNR. But in any case, the cows are spending a lot of time in the creeks and the rivers. And although he really didn't think it was worth trying to get the cows out of the creeks, he, he's not a firm advocate for fencing. He was totally up for working with us on it. And he really does wants to make sure that the cows are not portrayed as the bad guys in the TNOA system. And he has a really good point. There's a lot of other things going on in the TNOA beyond just what we see now as grazing. There's a huge history of land management in the TNOA that has contributed to existing condition. So last year, the Washington Conservation Corps crews built, oh, two miles of fence for us. I'm not sure we'll do this again. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. it's been really challenging, really, really challenging. And as the same uh, colleague who commented on the Mississippi River sagely sat back and said last month, yeah, there's a reason people don't usually build barbed wire fence down there in the floodplain. It's like, where the hell were you last year? <laughs> so we're experimenting with 
what kind of recovery do we see when we take part of the grazing pressure off a stream system? And if this turns out to really not be a cost-effective way to protect stream banks, we'll keep looking at other ways to do that. It's not intuitive. <laughs> so the protection of the stream banks was just one component of that project in the Tianoi. The larger component was looking at an alluvial floodplain where Jack Creek comes into the North Fork Tianoi and saying, okay, wow, this is not what we like to think of when we see an area that's providing rearing and spawning habitat for a federally listed species, in this case, steelhead. If we assume that our past land management in this area has contributed to this condition, what can we do now to make things better for a species that we're prioritizing at this point? And in this case, what we did was to look at a, a relic channel that was over here, further to the south, that was still in really good shape. It still had nice riparian cover, it still had some in-stream wood. And we went and we excavated about 30 feet or so of gravel that had been deposited in the early 90s, and put the primary channel back into the channel it had abandoned. It's kind of a, a heavy hand for restoration in this case, although not as heavy as some of the things that consultants suggested to us. But it's an interesting question when you're thinking about restoration. We know that our land management has led to this degraded condition. So where, how far are we willing to go with a pretty active hand in moving things to a condition that we think is desirable? And these are the questions we get to think about and balance when we're faced with putting together a restoration project. And they're really interesting, and they're not obvious. This is the last, oh, there's education. So hold that thought. Um, another kind of humans messing with things technique that we've been partnering with Fish and Wildlife on is taking beaver that are very active in the low elevations, like on your neighbor's property, for instance, trapping them and taking them up to the high elevations on national forest, and encouraging uh, trapping of floodwaters and increased groundwater recharge up high from beaver dam activity and helping landowners with problem beavers down low. And then we also get to do a lot of fun education, as Scott talked about. So I was thinking of anecdotes for you guys on this, and I have just, there's so many good ones, but there's one that I want to share because it makes me think about the other things we teach people when we're talking in classrooms and in, on field trips. I've been doing a lot of salmon education in my daughter's class this year at Damon Elementary. And the other day, one of her classmates slipped a picture for me into her folder so that she could bring it home, and it was to Becca from Reed. So it was all warm and fuzzy, and it showed, showed a creek and the hills and the trees, and a little stick figure that said Reed, and a stick figure that said Becca, and the Becca figure was saying, Young Poppy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm getting those messages. <laughs> We have a lot, of, a lot of fun opportunities to learn a lot of different things, and I really feel that we're making substantial change on small scales throughout this basin, put together with the work that all our colleagues are doing to really improve conditions for salmon, and as a result, for the, all of us who depend on salmon as a resource. So I invite you to come work with us. Thank you. Slipping out. Don't. Um, <laughs> Randall, everybody. This could not have been possible without him. I have great gratitude. He was a liaison between Central Washington and Columbia. Last year, we hosted 12 interns doing about 400 hours each, and they kicked butt. We have three here that's going to speak about their experiences. But they surveyed over five stream miles. They helped trap and relocate over 40 beavers. They did 115 vegetation transect, look at survivability plots, excluding cattle. I mean, they just went above and beyond weekly water quality measurements. And that's something mid Columbia didn't have staff time to do before that. Becca told you about all the great work we're doing, but it's busy, and there's only a few of us. So we don't have time to monitor our projects. So before that, we were just hoping that our projects were doing all the things we wanted it to do.
do. We hoped that the wood was going great places, but we really didn't know where it was going until our interns set up survivability plots and large wood transects, and now we know. So big thank you to them. Um, they, Central Washington really stepped up and helped fill that need for monitoring. So I'd love to introduce Spencer Kaja, one of my great interns from last year. He's going to talk a little bit about his experience and some of the work that he did. The bottom one. <laughs> All right, so I'm Spencer. Uh, I'm originally from Puyallup, Washington. I've lived in Western Washington pretty much my whole life, up until coming here. So been confined to the city for most of my life. So this has been a cool experience to be outdoors and be in a different environment. Uh, I'm a senior here. I plan on graduating in the spring here, so just two more months. Uh, I'm majoring in environmental policy um, with a minor in economics. All right, so as I mentioned before, uh, I'm an environmental policy student. Uh, so that means usually in the classroom, I've been working mostly with uh, things like impact statements, Clean Water Act, uh, interpreting any type of environmental regulation, which I find interesting, um, so I got into the major, but unfortunately most of the stuff that I do is in the classroom. So for me, this internship was an awesome opportunity to be outside. Um, some of the stuff I got to do uh, was just a wide variety of restoration projects that were just listed, but uh, mostly uh, the beaver uh, relocation project, which I think was cool. It's the first experience for me handling wildlife. Uh, a lot of different water quality um, measure or water quality techniques, which I think are a valuable skill set, things like pH, um, turbidity, stream flow discharge. All that stuff I think was really valuable to learn. And plant monitoring, which um, my appreciation has grown for, because there was just a lot of data being collected that I didn't think anyone was out there collecting, which is pretty cool. Uh, learn more about how the Yakima Basin and the different organizations work, which I guess is evidenced by the people in this room. Uh, when I had heard that I was going to work for Mid-Columbia Fisheries, I kind of thought I was going to be exclusively working with them, um, which was not the case. Um, got to it was brief, but work with a bunch of different organizations in this uh, room right now. Um, for students, I thought I'd be speaking to more students, but this internship is just a great opportunity to work outdoors. Uh, for a while there, we were hiking multiple miles a day in 90 degree heat, so I felt like I was getting in pretty good shape, which is a good thing, I guess, for students that are looking to do that. Um, and it's 400 hours, or I did 400 hours, which is 10 credit hours for students. So. That goes a long way towards knocking out your uh, graduation requirements. <clears throat> and then photography is not a strong suit of mine, but I was instructed to include pictures, so uh, <laughs> I have two of them for you guys. So <laughs> this is one that I took just to kind of highlight some of the cool areas that we get to work. And then another, I think this is Iron Creek, just another cool area to work at. So that's all I have for you guys. <laughs>
always very easy, and it was very bushy, and we were going over beaver dams. We were looking for locations where beavers either were previously at or um, areas that were good habitat to for relocation of beavers. And then um, Mark we had scorecards, and we would grade how good the area was, and we would give that information back to Mel or WDFW for um, possible future relocation. Um, beaver trapping was an awesome experience. We got to, to learn how to use hand-hop traps and um, snares. We went out really early in the morning to check them. And, um, and then when we had them, we brought them back to, um, to the facility down Highway 10 and, and got to handle them and, and learn more about them and then also take them out and relocate them. It was a, an awesome experience. Um, So these are some more of the pictures of us going out. And we also did community outreach. We worked um, at the park over here as well as up at Snoqualmie Pass, um, weeding and seeding the area with, um, oh, with um, Hello, the forestry. Wow. Yep. Oh, from Forest Service. Yep. So those were some outreach projects that we did as well. Um, once we were done gathering all our data during the day, we would go back to uh, the GIS lab and input all of our data, and we would make maps and record all, or upload, input all of our data so that we could um, use this data and send it off to Mill for um, future uh, internships. We also set up protocols of ways to um, collect the data, record it, and store it so that it would be useful. Um, you know, going out and actually taking the water measurements and um, pH and conductivity in the field was, was really interesting because you got to do in a group without teachers the actual stuff that you were learning in the labs where it was a more controlled atmosphere. So it was really interesting going out and, and actually doing the work yourself. And then, um, yeah, we got to work with beavers and a great group of people and spent our summer out in, this, out in the outdoors and it was really fun and exciting. And we <laughs> <laughs> a lot about uh, wildlife and a lot of fun. So. <laughs> I'm also an environmental studies major with policy specialist in Lake Spencer. I just finished up my classes this last fall and am walking in the stream. But being an avid uh, fisherman, I had a great time with this. As a fisherman and outdoorsman with this internship, I got to spend all day in the woods and walk on creeks and hike like up to three miles, four or five miles a day. And but uh, what well, we did a lot, the thing I liked the most was the beaver, is the beaver mapping and trapping like everyone. Been talking about, we got to use these are hand cock traps, basically like a big clamshell, and they just flip them up onto the bank at night when we catch them. We use snares a lot. One snare, we actually came up and there was a beaver like going around in the circle. And my uh, the Ben, the wildlife biologist at the time, had to like jump on top of the beaver and we had to like wrestle it in. And it, was, it was an interesting experience, first time like hands on with, with the wildlife. It was a lot of fun though. But safe. Very safe and very safe. <laughs> <laughs> Again, just beavers. These are tanks we held them in. We had to clean those out each time we brought a new beaver in. Uh, some dams. We, we actually found some dams that people hadn't didn't know were out there. Like I think it was on our second day. Spencer and I and two other interns found some dams. It was it was really cool. Spending all the time. I don't want to bore you with everything else everyone said. Uh, these GPS points, so we spent a lot of time putting these together. I wish I had the beaver mapping all put out because it was all color, color coordinated and it looked really nice. Or how much we hiked, it would have showed all a lot of the work we would have done. It was a great time. Um, just the pictures. This is on the TNA, I think. This is the middle fork, and this might be the west east fork. But just got to spend time outdoors. It was a great time. So, and so if there's any other students that are looking for interns, for internships, can't go wrong with this. It was a, it was a lot of fun. All right. We're almost done, but almost done. So this one geared heavily towards 
interning, but you can also volunteer. We've had a high school boy the last three years been with the Beaver Project. I have multiple volunteers planting with us, collecting cardboard, wood chips. We have a really big community involvement in Mid-Columbia Fisheries and Yakima Nation and all the other organizations we work with. But for interns, if you do know of anybody interested, we're still seeking. By April 15th, tax day, if anybody can get their applications into me, that would be swell. Looking for a resume and cover letters and any references, free references. We already still our three credit spring summer internship. That was the Bighorn Sheep Monitoring. We have two really qualified guys going out with fish and wildlife. We're looking for 10 more positions to fill. You could do a five credit option, which is just five credit summer, five credit weeks over the summer, or a 10 credit, which is just 10 summer weeks. So a difference of 200 hours or 400 hours in the field with us. Working on all these different projects that Scott talked about, and maybe some stuff for Casino one day, and with Big Columbia Fisheries Fish and Wildlife. So with that, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, I'd like to invite them all up, and you could fire away. Here's my contact information. <coughs> for resumes or volunteering, ways to get more involved in your community. I also have cards over by the cookies. Feel free to grab them. Good placement. Yay. <laughs>